Welcome to the Cash Car Convert Podcast, Episode 17. You're listening to the Cash Car Convert Podcast with James Kinson. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cash Car Convert Podcast. My name is James Kinson and I am the Cash Car Convert. And this is the podcast where cash cars are cool and auto debt is dangerous to your financial future. I'm really looking forward to doing today's episode. I've had a really long week, um, did some travel this week, and have had some really long days. So I'm looking forward to getting to the end of the week here. But uh, I always look forward to getting to speak to you folks and getting this podcast out. So uh, I'm doing another late night to get this one done, but uh, I'm really excited about it. And hopefully you can hear that in my voice. Before I get into the main topic uh, for this episode, I wanted to uh, give another reminder of a speaking engagement that I'm going to be having on March 4th, and that is going to be the Podcast Dallas Meetup, and that's organized by Gary Leland and Mitch Todd, and again, that's going to be Tuesday, March 4th at 6.30 p.m. My presentation is going to be covering getting great interview subjects for your podcast and getting noticed. So uh, so I hope uh, if you're a fan of the show, please come out. I'd love to have your support. And then I'd also uh, love to meet you afterwards and uh, really look forward to that. I've, I've been to uh, some meetups like this and uh, they're always a really great time. So I would really love it if you uh, could make it out. All right, let's get into the, uh, today's episode. I received a message from our reader of my blog back at the end of December, really right before the launch of my podcast. So it was... Uh, pretty late in December. And this gentleman uh, actually reached out to me via SpeakPipe on my uh, website, cashcarconvert.com. And he told me that he's got a 2006 VW Passat and that he and his wife really love the car and they enjoy driving it. He said it was coming up on 100,000 miles and he was concerned about how much it might start to cost in repairs and that they were getting pretty costly. So he was thinking about getting a new car, maybe one with a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty, and he wanted to get my feedback on it. He also told me that uh, the car he was currently driving was paid off. So if I had been speaking to him directly, I would have asked a few more questions, but since I, you know, just got input from him and I didn't get uh, a chance to to ask him any questions, I just made a few assumptions and went ahead and uh, and responded to his uh, his, his question. And basically what I said is that, you know, I appreciated where he was coming from. And it, it did sound like to me, and, and what I heard in his voice is that he and his wife did enjoy driving their VW Passat, but that, you know, either it was too expensive to maintain or he was concerned that it was going to be too expensive to maintain. And I went on to tell him that while I didn't know his, his situation fully, I was going to, uh, you know, approach this, uh, you know, using industry averages as a way to... Uh, to discuss the topic with him. I also didn't know whether he was planning to take out a car loan for the new car or whether he was planning to pay cash. The, I went on to tell him that uh, you know whether he was going to be in debt for it or whether he was going to pay cash, I didn't recommend buying a new car. And the reason is, and, and I gave a Dave Ramsey quote, Dave Ramsey says, remember, unless you're a millionaire, you cannot afford a new car because you can't take the hit in depreciation. Now, I knew this. Um, I've heard Dave say this many times, and as those of you who listen to the show regularly know, I'm a, a Dave Ramsey fan, and uh, that's the reason I'm doing this podcast. If I never read his book, uh, you wouldn't be hearing my voice. So, uh, so I, I really take to heart what Dave has to say in these kinds of situations. So I wanted to do something to illustrate this point uh, for the gentleman who, uh, who uh, reached out to me. I have outlined uh, the depreciation. So I told him, look, I'm not sure what new car you're considering, so therefore let me just use some industry averages. According to Edmunds.com, an average new car sells for around $31,000, and this is based on numbers from back in August of 2013. So they're a little dated, but I, I, you know, I think they illustrate the point. Now, in the note that I wrote back to him, I actually listed the depreciation, uh, the average depreciation, based on a calculator that's uh, found on the, on the Edmunds website. It's called, uh, it's the depreciation infographic, how fast does my new car lose value? And based on that uh, infographic, uh, I came up with the following numbers. A new car on the lot 
is valued at $31,000. At the end of the first year, it's worth $23,334, so it's lost $7,666. At the end of the second year, it's worth $19,821. At the end of the third year, it's $16,731. At the end of the fourth year, it's $13,993. At the end of the fifth year, it's worth $11,535. So in the five years that you've owned that vehicle, you would have lost $19,465 in depreciation. Now, on top of the depreciation, there's also the matter of car payments. Now, the average car payment is roughly $464 a month. Now, this works out to about $5,600 a year. My view is you can do a lot of repairs on your Passat for $5,600 a year. But the story is even more compelling. If you combine the depreciation at $7,666 and the car payments for the first year at $5,600, the new car costs $13,266 for the first 12 months. Now, I know some of you out there are going to be saying, well, yes, that's true, but you don't realize that loss until you sell the car. And, you know, if you own that car for 10 or 12 years, then, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're not really losing that money uh, at that time. And that's probably true. Um, and I don't have the average uh, amount of time a person owns a new car at the tip of my tongue uh, or my fingertips here. But I will say that uh, most people don't own their car uh, more than about four or five years. So uh, so the idea that, that uh, uh, you might keep yours for 10 or 12, you know, makes you somebody that's outside the norm. So, uh, so most people are going to realize this hit sooner rather than later. So I went on to tell this gentleman that if, if after looking at those numbers, um, he still thought the 2006 Passat was too expensive to maintain and he wanted to get another car, I wouldn't recommend him buying a new car. I would recommend him buying a two-year-old car for cash. And, and what this does for him is, you know, A, by buying it with cash, then he, he uh, uh, you know, doesn't have to pay interest. So that saves him some money. But it also means that a significant portion of the depreciation has already been taken by the original owner. And again, uh, that's something that uh, those are real dollars, right? You, you, you don't feel it until you sell the car, but, uh, you know, that depreciation is a real number that hits your, your income. Now, you can go and find good low mileage vehicles that are a couple of years old. And you can also get one with a warranty oftentimes. Now, if you're really you know, concerned about the warranty aspect of things, you know, you could also look to buy a certified pre-owned car to put your mind a little more at ease, I told him. The thing you have to know there is that, you know, nothing's free in life. So if you're buying a certified pre-owned car, then you're paying a little more for the dealership to take that risk. And uh, and so you just have to kind of know that going in, that there's a, there's a value that they're putting on that and, and you pay for that. The next thing I wanted to tell him is, is that, uh, you know, if I was in his shoes, I wouldn't be buying a new car. Both the uh, cars my wife and I are driving, uh, we purchased them with over 100,000 miles on them. So mine's a Ford F-150. At the time that I uh, wrote this gentleman, it had 146,000 miles on it and had made multiple trips from Fort Worth to Atlanta, Georgia and back. And the most recent one was just this past Thanksgiving in 2013. So I drive this car you know, halfway across the country and don't think twice about it. I, I have full confidence in it. Um, you know, I maintain it and take care of it. And I feel confident that it's going to get me, uh, you know, from point A to point B safely and reliably. I also corresponded with him later and, and reminded him that most cars today are engineered to go about 250,000 miles if they're maintained properly. So in closing in my original note, I, I said, if I were him, I would proactively have any necessary repairs done on the Passat to handle any problems that a mechanic could proactively find and, and identify. And I would then uh, make sure that I got all the required maintenance done, oil changes, fluids, timing belt if needed, and etc. What I would then subsequently do is I would pay myself the car payment that I would have been making on the new car. Then I could set those funds aside and if my Passat had a need for repairs, then I would have the money set aside to do so, and I wouldn't feel like it was such an emergency and, and so painful. And whatever money didn't go on repairs, I would save for my next cash car. I subsequently uh, included some links to some web articles, and these will be in the show notes as well, but just some other information to try to help him make an informed decision. The first one was uh, 
the top five ways to make your car run forever. The next one was how to find a good mechanic. The next article was should you keep your old car. And the next one was a, a blog post of mine called five reasons to buy a new car question mark. And then last I linked to uh, an article called auto leases entice but they're still costly. And I uh, made a little side note there that that article is about more than leasing. And uh, I think a lot of people would enjoy reading that. So uh, again, that'll be, that'll be uh, linked up in the show notes. So that was my closing. I finished by uh, thanking him. He's a, a gentleman that's in the service. I thanked him for his service to our country. And I felt like it was a real honor for me to provide my thoughts and share the resources that I was able to find uh, to him. And I hoped it would help him make an informed decision. Now, before I get to his response, I just want to say that his thoughts weren't that unusual. There are a lot of people out there who are driving vehicles and they start to think that they're costing them too much and they start to become disgruntled with the vehicle, right? They've had it for a while. They start to get a little tired of it. It's not the new car that they bought. It's not the nice car that they bought. It's just the car they're driving now. Maybe the tires are getting worn. Maybe the brakes are starting to squeal and need to be replaced. Uh, maybe it needs a, a, a good washing, right? So I know I feel better about my vehicle when it's clean. And given the weather we've had off and on here uh, recently in the DFW area, mine is not right now. So uh, I, I know I'll feel better about it when it's clean. But people honestly make decisions this way. And, and, and they will think, okay, this car, it's worn out. It's costing me too much. I need to, uh, to get a new one. And I really need that warranty. And they don't really look at the total cost of ownership of a vehicle, and they certainly don't take into account oftentimes depreciation. Now for his response. You have confirmed what I was wanting to ignore. Amazing how my impulse to spend money simply for the rush, even though it goes against my better judgment. I've actually followed all of your advice with the Passat. I bought it when four years old for a great price with low miles, put a warranty on it, and have done meticulous preventive maintenance. I think I should probably begin putting aside cash each month for the next several years so I can pay cash for my next car, like you suggest. You really have a great niche. I can't wait to hear your podcast. Again, this was before my podcast was out. Now, I was way beyond excited to get this response. And what I want to do is I want to challenge all of you listening who are in a similar situation to take a hard look at the numbers before you pull the trigger on a new car. And I would say, please reach out to me if you need help. That's what I'm here for comment on my show notes, reach out to me on Twitter, shoot me an email at cashcarconvert at gmail.com, leave me a speak pipe message on my website, cashcarconvert.com, uh, as this gentleman did. You know, I'll be happy to do what I can to help out. And, and, you know, if you have a question, chances are there are a lot of other people out there who have that question and maybe they won't ask me. So for any of you that this article or the, this uh, podcast episode helps, be aware that, you know, I had the uh, the opportunity to do this podcast episode because I had this gentleman, you know, reach out to me and ask this question. And that gave me the opportunity to speak to it. All right. Now on to my next topic. I want to note uh, before I get started with this next topic that unless otherwise stipulated, all the data I use in the remainder of this podcast was pulled from a report in GoBankingRates.com. Now we're a couple of months into 2014. And this is a time when many of us take stock of how we're, you know, doing against our New Year's resolutions. Are we still on course? Are we better off or worse off than we were in December? And I think many of us tend to lose focus uh, quickly uh, to our New Year's resolutions. And what we start to see is the gym will start to get back to its normal level of activity. The resolutions about getting up early fall to the wayside and we spend more time with our pillow. And likewise, the desire to be financially fit may slip away as well. Well, I want to help give you a few reasons to stay on course with your uh, financial fitness program. And I'm going to give you four reasons not to be an average American. Number one, the average American has credit card debt of $15,263 with an annual percentage rate of 14.95%. So that means the average American has $15,263 of debt, unsecured, who knows what they used it for? If they were like me. They probably just, uh, you know, took trips, bought clothes, went out to eat, and didn't really, uh, didn't really watch their, their budget. So that's number one. 
Number two, the average American has student loan debt of $31,646. Now that's a number that, uh, that I think is, is climbing. So it, won't, it wouldn't surprise me to hear that number go up over time. Uh, I've heard people say that student loan debt is now the you know, number one credit issue or you know, maybe number two behind credit cards. I personally still think the, uh, the car loan is the number one issue, and I'll get to why I think that here in just a minute. But uh, if you're a student out there and you're in college, you really need to think about what you're spending on college and what the outcome is going to be when you graduate. There are a lot of people going to college right now who are expecting a big payoff when they graduate, and it doesn't always come. And if you're going to a private college to get a job that's going to pay you thirty or forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, and you're going to run up, you know, fifty, seventy-five, a hundred thousand dollars in debt, student loan debt, you know, I'm going to encourage you to think twice about where you're going to school and find a state school uh, in your in your area where you can go and have an opportunity to to either go with no debt or at least much less debt. You know, my my encouragement would be to go with no debt. Uh, you're going to come out the other side feeling a lot better about yourself and your situation. But uh, but certainly think twice about going to a private school that's really expensive to uh, you know to get a thirty, forty, or fifty thousand dollar a year job. Number three, the average American has auto loan debt of thirty thousand seven hundred and thirty eight dollars. Now the travesty about this is a couple of fold. I think first of all. It's less than the student loan debt. So again, people are going to look at that and say, well, yep, student loan debt is, is a bigger problem. Well, I disagree, and here's why. That student loan debt that they have, $31,646, that's a one-time event. That's the average, and they're going to pay that off, and most people are going to be done with their student loan debt. That $30,000 of car loan, almost $31,000, that's going to repeat every three, four, five years. You're going to trade that car in and you're going to get another one. And, and cars have gone up 11% in, in uh, price since 2009. So, you know, I don't know how much more they're going to go up over the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. Depending on your age, that's how much longer you're going to be looking to buy cars. So I think this revolving auto debt at $31,000 and probably climbing is a bigger problem for Americans not just because of the debt and the interest that's paid on these debts, but also because of the depreciation I talked about uh, in the previous segment. That's the, that's the hidden charge that, that people tend to just forget about. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I was guilty of that too, right? I bought a new car and, uh, you know, sold it about two and a half years later, and it had lost uh, almost $6,000 in value, I think. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, you know, it was a significant amount. Uh, so, so just think twice about that. That's why I'm, I'm so focused on, on people driving cash cars, getting their egos in check, you know, selling those cars that have debt on them and buying something that they can truly afford. And instead of making, you know, $464 a month in car payments and climbing over the next 40 years, you know, pay yourself that money, you know, do the math on how much that works out to be and think about how much better off your life would be if you could use some of that money to buy another car, some of that money to fund your retirement, some of that money to fund your, your child's education, some of that money to go uh, on vacations. You know, so, so there's lots of things you could do with that money if you were paying yourself. So this goes back to my, uh, you know, one of my little catchphrases here is invest in yourself, not things. And a car is a thing. It's a tool. Gets you from point A to point B. It, it has nothing to do with your identity. Uh, I don't care if you drive a Mercedes or a BMW or a Honda Civic. Most people don't really care. People you don't know will see you get out of those vehicles and maybe they'll have a passing thought. But five seconds later, later they're right back to being concerned about their own life and uh, you're the furthest thing from their mind. You're paying an awfully high price to impress people that you don't know. All right, moving on. Number four, only 59% of Americans have at least $500 in savings. Isn't that amazing, folks? People are making $464 a month car payments on average for a new car, and only 59% of Americans have at least $500 in savings. What an absolute crime that is. You know, if you're one of the people out there who are in this situation, you know, if you are the average American today, 
you can't change the decisions that brought you to the indebtedness you, you have now. You can, however, make a choice, make a decision not to continue on the path to increase your indebtedness. You can put a stake in the ground and make a decision to change your life. Dave Ramsey talks about it in terms of uh, getting to the point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I think that's just eloquent enough to get the idea across. So, uh, so I like that. So there's some good news about the average American. And that is the median annual income is $52,782. Now, if you compare this to the global annual median income, and this I found in a 2012 article from the Daily Mail, the median income globally is $1,225 a year. In America, it isn't an income problem. It's a spending and borrowing problem. It's out of control. People don't know where their money's going. They're not budgeting. They're spending more time thinking about where they're going to go to dinner this weekend than they are about what they're going to do in retirement or how they're going to do something besides the job that they hate, that they're locked into because they have all this debt and they have no margin in their life to make another type of decision. You know, I've, I've, I suspect I've got a lot of different type of folks listening out there. Maybe all of you have some level of debt issues. Maybe you're all in debt on your cars. Or, or maybe I found some followers who uh, you know, are, are like me and they're cash car converts. But I don't care if you're the person following Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University philosophy or if you're the guy following MJ DeMarco's Millionaire Fast Lane philosophy. Both of these philosophies have one thing in common. And that is, they both agree that you have to spend less than you earn to get ahead. And the average American does not do that. And the difference between those two, for, for those of you who, who may not be familiar with these two gentlemen, Dave Ramsey is about being out of debt, taking control of your finances, and saving money for retirement. So MJ DeMarco calls that uh, getting rich the slow way, or the, in the slow lane. And he's a believer in in what he calls the millionaire fast lane philosophy. And what he means by that is that you find a way to start your own business and, and accelerate your earnings. Now, I've had people on my podcast who live that type of life. They've bridged from doing something like the rest of us do with a nine to five type job, and they got themselves in a position where they had some margin in their lives, and they were able to, to then make the leap to their dream of having their own business of some sort. And that's what I'm trying to, to inspire you guys with. And, you know, it's one of the reasons I have uh, interview guests on my show, because I don't want you to just know my story, uh, you know, that I was in debt and, and I was able to work my way out of it. I mean, that's all well and good. But there are people who've done many more amazing things in their journey than I have. And I want to bring those people to you to let you know what's possible, because I think so many of you out there have this greatness in you. But you're shackled to debt. You're a slave to debt. And I want you to shake those shackles loose, kick off the bondage of debt, and start to live the life that you deserve to live. All right, I'll get off my soapbox now on that, and I'll get back to, to the topic at hand here. According to the Bureau of Labor, Labor and Statistics, for the year that ended in 2012, in most households, the second largest annual expense is the car. And that's only second to the expense of housing. In my view, it's much easier to drive a cheaper car than to move to a cheaper house or apartment. This makes your car a prime target to be the fastest way to get you out of debt and to get your lifestyle under control. If you look at my previous posts and podcasts, you'll learn how to find and buy a good and expensive cash car. You can also find a post on how to sell your current car. There will be a podcast uh, coming soon to cover that same topic. For those of you who, who don't like to go out and read blogs, I'll be happy to cover that here in an in upcoming episode of my, my podcast. Whether you choose to reduce your annual expenses by downsizing your car or in some other area of your life, make controlling your spending and reducing your expenses a priority for the remainder of 2014. Don't be an average American. This is the Cash Car Convert. I appreciate you listening. Thank you so much for taking the time to let me speak into your life. Have a blessed day. All right. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. The show notes can be found at cashcarconvert.com slash 017. Again, that's cashcarconvert.com slash 017. 
If you found this episode useful, if you're enjoying this podcast and you think it's bringing value to you, please go out to iTunes and subscribe. And once you're out there on iTunes and you've subscribed, go out and leave a rating and review. I got another one the other day, so I'm up to 19. I've got a couple more weeks in New and Noteworthy uh, within iTunes, and I would really like to see um, myself get to at least 25 reviews. So I'm hoping that uh, those of you who are listening, who feel like you're getting something out of this, could just take a couple of minutes. It really doesn't take more than that to go out there and, and leave a rating and review. And it really does make a big difference in my ability to get noticed uh, within iTunes and to get my message out to a larger audience. For anybody who uh, would like, when you're out on the show notes page, you can feel free to leave me a comment out there. I uh, always check those out. I also uh, respond to Twitter quite well, so if uh, anybody wants to reach out to me on Twitter, I'm at Cash Car Convert. Again, that's at Cash Car Convert. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, love to get a follow. Love to get a chat from you. So uh, reach out to me, please. If you have a comment about this episode, or if you would like for me to uh, cover a particular topic in a future episode, uh, you can certainly leave that in the show notes. You can send me an email at Cash Car Convert at gmail.com. Again, that's cashcarconvert at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to the Cash Car Convert podcast. This is James Kenson. I am the Cash Car Convert. I want to help you buy a cash car and kick auto debt to the curb.